Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Claudia, for the uh, nice introduction and uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, so uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, visit CMU uh, virtually. So today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, my recent work with my uh, students and collaborators about uh, stochastic gradient design. So I will show you two very uh, interesting uh, phenomena in uh, XGD, uh, which are uh, been offer fitting and uh, uh, implicit regularization. So this is a joint work based on, uh, this is uh, based on a joint work with my student, Di uh, uh, and my collaborators, uh, Jingfeng Wu, uh, Vova, Bing Foster, and uh, Sean Kadi. Okay, so deep learning has achieved a uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, successes in different application domains. Uh, and most of the deep learning problems uh, can uh, boil down to a, a optimization problem where you, where you want to minimize uh, this function. Uh, uh, f of theta, where f is some uh, loss function composed with uh, the neural network function, and theta is the parameter of the neural network. And in uh, most uh, uh, cases, this f of theta is a non convex function uh, because the neural network function is uh, uh, non convex and non smooth. So it turns out to be a very uh, uh, challenging optimization problem. But uh, uh, if you use the guys gradient design to solve it, uh, in uh, many cases, actually, you can find a very good solution, uh, which gives you a small uh, generalization error. And if you look at the uh, 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 change of the, the size of the neural network, actually, uh, you can see a very clear trend that the size of the neural network has increased a lot uh, since the uh, maybe uh, 10 years ago. So let's say the inception uh, model, uh, it contains 5 million parameters. And for ResNet uh, 50, it contains 23 million parameters. And you can see that the size of new networks uh, keeps increasing. And uh, for the uh, very recent uh, GTP, uh, GPT uh, 3 models, it contains 175 million billion parameters, okay, so which is a huge network. And uh, this makes the training and also learning of new networks very challenging because uh, we will be in a so-called over parameterized regime, where the number of parameters of a neural network will be uh, much, much larger than the number of training data points. But uh, surprisingly, uh, even uh, the neural network is over parameterized uh, such that it can uh, memorize the training data point. But at the same time, uh, people observe that uh, even though uh, the neural network can memorize the training data point, it can still generalize uh, pretty well onto the test that they are upon uh, in many uh, application scenarios. Okay, for instance, uh, in this uh, paper by uh, Mitchell by the all, they uh, have done some uh, experiments on ResNet uh, 18 uh, uh, neural network, and they increase the uh, number of parameters in this neural network. And uh, you can see that uh, when the number of parameters in uh, ResNet 18 uh, is greater than certain uh, threshold, uh, it can memorize the training error point and achieve zero training error. But if you keep increasing uh, the size of uh, this network, uh, not only the training error will stay at zero, but also the test error uh, will further decrease. Okay. So this is a contradictory to the traditional wisdom of uh, uh, machine learning where uh, there's a, a bias variance trade-off or bias complexity trade-off. Uh, but here we don't see uh, this trade-off. So even the neural network can memorize or overfit the training data set. Uh, it can still have very good uh, generalization performance on the test uh, data set. And this phenomenon uh, is called uh, binal overfitting uh, in uh, one of the uh, seminar papers uh, written by uh, Bartlett et al. So the uh, natural question is uh, how and when uh, this uh, binal overfitting uh, phenomenon uh, can occur uh, in practice. Okay. And in order to answer uh, these questions, uh, there is uh, a line of uh, uh, papers uh, in the past uh, uh, two or three years. They try to uh, prove this phenomenon fitting uh, phenomenon uh, for some uh, over parameterized machine learning models, such as a linear regression or a logistic regression, uh, when the uh, number of parameters is larger than the number of uh, training point. So here I just uh, uh, list a subset of uh, uh, references. I, I may miss some others. Uh, 
if I miss uh, some of your work, I apologize and I'm happy to uh, include them here. Uh, however, if you look at this result, uh, so most of these results are for minimal norm solution, uh, which is uh, the empirical risk minimizer of some uh, uh, EIM uh, problem, for example, uh, linear regression problem or logistic regression problem. Okay. The algorithmic aspect of this phenomenon of a fitting phenomenon actually is still uh, less understood because in practice, we are not, uh, uh, for example, uh, solving this empirical risk minimization problem exactly to get the exact empirical risk minimizer. We are using stochastic gradient descent uh, to, uh, to optimize uh, uh, some kind of a loss function. Right? So what is interesting is uh, uh, what is the, uh, behavior or what is the property of the solution uh, written by the cat gradient set. And this is largely missing uh, in uh, existing analysis. So uh, in our work, uh, we are trying to uh, understand the, the, the access risk of online the cat gradient descent with confident step sets uh, while solving a linear regression uh, problem. And another interesting phenomenon uh, in addition to binal overfitting uh, which is also very close, closely related to uh, binal overfitting is called implicit uh, regularization. So uh, in many studies, including uh, one of the papers I uh, listed here, uh, they have done experiments on, uh, for example, training a, CIFA, uh, training a neural network, let's say two-layer neural network on CIFAR-10 uh, image data set. And they found that uh, uh, in terms of the test error, the test error achieved by, for example, uh, empirical risk minimization with, uh, with decay or with L2 regularization, uh, which is uh, denoted by this green uh, line in this plot. And the test error of HGD without explicit regularization, but with early stopping. So these two uh, solutions, they have a very uh, similar uh, test error. Uh, and when you uh, increase, uh, for example, the width of the new network, uh, this H is the width of new network. So when you increase the width of new network, you can see that uh, uh, this uh, uh, right line and this uh, uh, green line actually they stay uh, very close uh, uh, to each other. So which means uh, there are some uh, implicit uh, or some regularization effect of HGD uh, with early stopping. And in order to uh, explain this uh, uh, implicit regularization. Uh, for linear regression problem and for gradient descent with very uh, uh, small flat size or for gradient flow, actually, uh, it's very easy to show that if gradient descent or gradient flow uh, starting uh, from the origin, then uh, it will uh, convert it to a minimal norm solution of the empirical risk. So here, the minimum norm solution is defined as uh, uh, you minimize the L2 norm of the, uh, the weight W uh, subject to uh, this equality uh, conjoint. So this equality conjoint basically uh, uh, suggests that you, uh, the linear regression uh, model need to uh, memorize or need to uh, interpolate the uh, chain data set. And uh, this result has also been uh, extended to uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, for sufficiently small uh, learning rate. And uh, uh, actually, uh, this uh, result has been uh, 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 derived by uh, a set of authors, some of them now also from uh, CMU. So basically, uh, they show that HGD can be described as a uh, stochastic gradient flow uh, whose behavior is uh, uh, very much uh, close to uh, gradient flow. And uh, they further show that uh, uh, the behavior of HGD at time t uh, is nearly equivalent to uh, solution of rich regression. Uh, with regularization parameter of one uh, divided by t. Okay, so there's a very uh, nice uh, equivalence between uh, HGD with early stopping and the rigid regression uh, with certain uh, regularization parameter. Uh, but uh, 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 this result actually they require a sufficiently small learning rate. So in other words, they need a stochastic gradient descent uh, to be very close to to be very close to uh, gradient flow. Uh, and uh, therefore they need the uh, learning rate to be very, very small. But in practice, when people apply uh, stochastic gradient descent, uh, 
they use constant step size, they not use uh, infinitesimal step size. So that's the uh, limitation of this uh, work. Okay, so based on uh, these uh, observations, so in our work, we are trying to uh, derive the sharpest possible access risk for uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, for solving the linear regression problems. Uh, so during my talk, if you have any questions, feel free uh, to interrupt me. I'm happy to uh, address your questions. So in the rest of this talk, I will be uh, focused on uh, this over parameterized uh, linear regression problem. Uh, the reason is uh, without a good understanding of linear regression uh, in the over parameterized regime, uh, it's really, uh, it's almost impossible to, uh, to say something about uh, deep learning. Uh, and if you have a uh, uh, thorough understanding of uh, uh, SGD for uh, solving linear regression problems, then some of the insight can be carried over to understanding the, uh, the, the performance of SGD uh, for training new network. All right, so the linear regression problem, uh, the goal is to uh, find the uh, minimizer of the population uh, risk, which is uh, uh, defined here. So this LD of W is a population risk. Uh, we, uh, we minimize uh, the expectation uh, of this uh, square loss, uh, which is uh, the difference between uh, Y and uh, the inner product of W and X. So here X is input, Y is output, and W is the weight uh, of the linear regression uh, predictor. And the expectation is taken over some uh, joint distribution uh, of X and Y. And we define the uh, population risk minimizer as a uh, uh, W star, uh, which is the mean of uh, uh, the population risk. And if the covariance matrix of uh, X uh, is positive definite, and then this LD of W is a strongly convex, and so there's a unique uh, minimizer, unique W star. Uh, if it is not uh, uh, strongly convex, then uh, actually there may exist many uh, uh, solutions. Uh, or many W star, but we can still uh, uh, deal with it if we restrict ourselves to some subspace. Uh, but for simplicity, let's just assume uh, there exists a unique W star. And our goal is to uh, minimize this uh, access risk, uh, which is defined as a difference between uh, the population risk of some uh, W uh, returned by stochastic gradient descent and uh, the minimum possible uh, population risk LD of W star. And if we uh, rewrite, uh, uh, for example, take a difference between y and the double star and x, we will get some uh, uh, random uh, fireball quasi, uh, which is a noise, which can be viewed as a noise. And we assume uh, the noise has conditional uh, uh, zero mean and uh, bounded Ferenc uh, sigma square. Okay. So this is the basic setup of the uh, linear regression problem we uh, consider in, in this work. And we also, uh, uh, I believe many of you are familiar with the stochastic gradient descent, uh, but let me uh, still uh, give you a quick review of this constant step size HGD, uh, just in case. So uh, at each iteration, uh, this constant step HGD will, uh, for example, start from uh, WT uh, minus one, it will take a, a one step along the negative direction of the stochastic gradient descent. Uh, using this uh, uh, step size, uh, continent step size gamma. Okay, so gamma is a positive uh, continent step size. And uh, this process is uh, uh, repeated many times because it's uh, like the iterative uh, update. And in the end, we will average uh, this uh, WT uh, uh, from the beginning all the way to the end. Okay, so we average this uh, WT from T equal to zero to N minus one. And we define the average uh, iterate as a W bar. Okay. And then this problem, uh, this algorithm, uh, constant step size HGD, uh, has been analyzed uh, in uh, several papers, including the paper by uh, Jian Luo. So they uh, study the excess risk of constant step size uh, HGD for uh, this square regression, uh, but in the classical regime where uh, the dimension D is, uh, uh, is fixed and uh, the sum of size N uh, can uh, go to infinity. But uh, uh, in our setting, uh, the dimension uh, the dimension of the input x uh, can be uh, possibly uh, infinite. Okay, so in that case, uh, 
the result from uh, Profit's work, including this uh, paper by Jen Hall, cannot be uh, directly applicable because in otherwise the, the because of the access risk will uh, uh, will uh, blow up when the dimension of input uh, equal to infinity. Therefore, we need a, a more refined analysis uh, for constant step size HDD uh, in the over parameterized uh, setting. So before I uh, show the main result, let me uh, uh, give you some, uh, introduce you to some uh, condition we call it the fourth order uh, moment condition. Okay. So here H is the uh, population uh, data covariance matrix. And this fourth order moment condition is stated as uh, uh, for any uh, positive semi-definite matrix A, if you apply uh, the X, uh, if you multiply XX transpose to the uh, left side of A and also XX transpose to the right hand side of A, and then you take expectation. So remember that this is a matrix, okay. The matrix uh, is, uh, let's say only equal to the trace of H A times H times some constant alpha, okay. So this uh, inequality is a matrix inequality, okay. And uh, similarly, uh, we have uh, a, sim a lower bound. So this uh, fourth order moment uh, matrix uh, is lower bounded by uh, another constant beta uh, times uh, trace H A times H. So let me give you uh, one example. For example, if X, uh, is a modified uh, Gaussian, okay? In that case, uh, we can show that alpha uh, equal to three and beta equal to two. So these two conditions actually, uh, they uh, basically uh, suggest the up and the lower bound of this four, fourth order uh, moment uh, uh, matrix. And uh, the first condition will be used in the uh, proof of the upper bound uh, for the excess risk. And the, uh, the lower bound condition will be used uh, to prove the lower bound for the access risk uh, of online HDD. Okay. And you can see that uh, for Gaussian data, uh, alpha and beta actually, they are, they are all uh, constant. Uh, so this condition actually itself is a pretty uh, sharp uh, condition uh, to characterize this uh, fourth order moment. And as I mentioned before, this H is the uh, population covariance matrix, uh, we can do eigenvalue decomposition. And even though uh, uh, the dimension of X uh, can be, for example, infinite, then we can uh, do this eigen decomposition in a, a Hilbert space. So let's uh, denote the eigenvalue of H as uh, lambda I and the corresponding eigenvector or eigenfunction as uh, VI, okay. And uh, based on uh, this eigenvalue and eigenvector, we can define three uh, norms uh, of the moderator to H. Uh, so one of the norms of uh, W star is there's a, a regular, this is standard mahalo lobbyist norm, which is uh, uh, essentially just uh, H star transpose W star transpose times H times uh, W star. Okay, and you can uh, write it as a summation of the uh, inner product square weighted by lambda i, okay. And the second norm actually, uh, we call it the H inverse norm, but this norm we define it in the, the height space. Uh, of H, uh, which is the space uh, that contains the, the leading eigenvalues of H. And in this height space, actually, we first take the inner product between W star and VI, VI is the eigenvector, and then we take square, and then we normalize it by lambda I. Because lambda I is a, a large number in the uh, head space, so we use a, a, a lambda I uh, input uh, to weight this uh, inner product square, and then we sum up them together uh, up to uh, some index K, okay? And the last norm uh, is the uh, H uh, tail space, Norm. And uh, we first uh, take the inner product between uh, W star and VI. VI is eigenvector, we take square and then weighted it by lambda i. Okay, instead of lambda i inverse, we uh, weighted it by lambda i because the lambda i uh, tend to be small in the tail space of uh, H. Okay, 
So these three norms will be uh, repeatedly used in our main result. So, and uh, uh, why uh, we uh, end up uh, with these norms will be, uh, the reason will be clear in the, uh, in, in when I get to the uh, exposition of the main result. Okay. So this is the, uh, the first uh, main result of uh, uh, in this talk. So we first derive the access response for uh, SGD, uh, for online SGD with constant step size. So if the step size is uh, gamma is less than or equal to uh, one uh, divided by alpha times the trace of H. So remember that alpha is a parameter showing up in the, uh, in the upper bound in the uh, fourth order moment matrix. So this is actually the largest possible uh, learning rate we can use for uh, stochastic gradient descent. And we define K star, uh, which is the smallest K, such that the eigenvalue uh, lambda K is less than or equal to one divided by N times gamma. Okay, so gamma is the step size and is the number of iteration. So this K star uh, can be uh, viewed as a, some kind of effective dimension. And we assume uh, SGD start with a zero, start with the zero point. So W zero equal to uh, zero vector. Then we can prove that the access response of uh, the average output uh, W bar uh, is bounded by uh, effective bias arrow and the effective variance arrow, okay? So here the effective bias, uh, this term, uh, it contains two uh, terms. Uh, the first one actually, you can see that uh, it will uh, diminish, it's in order like of uh, one divided by gamma square n square. So uh, it will uh, uh, diminish when n uh, increase, okay. And the second term is the h star tail uh, norm of W star. Okay, the tail h star norm of W star. And you can see that if you increase n, then if you increase n, the number of iteration, then this lambda k, uh, this k actually will uh, increase. Okay, this k star will increase. And then the tail actually uh, space will uh, decrease. So this norm actually will still uh, decrease when n uh, increase. Okay, so in other words, the bias will uh, decrease as a uh, uh, number of iterations uh, increase. The intuition actually is pretty clear because uh, when uh, you perform stochastic gradient descent and when uh, stochastic gradient descent get closer and closer to uh, to W star, uh, the bias will uh, uh, diminish. And uh, the effective variance, uh, the second term in the upper bound, uh, it is a, a little bit more uh, complicated, but let me unpack this bound uh, uh, for you. So it contains two terms. The first term actually uh, can be viewed as the variance contributed by the model uh, noise, uh, which is a proportional to uh, this uh, uh, sigma square. So remember that the sigma square is the variance of the noise. Okay. And if you look at uh, the uh, denominator, this denominator one minus gamma uh, times trace of h, uh, due to the choice of a step size in uh, deciding actually this is a, a, a constant. Okay. And inside this uh, uh, parenthesis, the first term is uh, k star divided by n. Because k star uh, can be understood as the effective dimension. So this k star divided by n uh, can be uh, compared with, uh, for example, d divided by n in the classical uh, access response for SGD uh, in the fixed uh, d uh, setting in classical uh, regime. And the second term is the, the tail sum. Uh, the tail sum of uh, uh, the eigenvalue square uh, in the tail space and the times uh, n and the gamma square. So this fact, due to this fact, it's possible that uh, when n increase, actually this term will increase. But depending on, uh, but this tail sum of lambda i square will decrease when n increase because this k star will become larger and larger. So there's uh, some trade-off. So depending on how fast the eigenvalue of H uh, decays, uh, this term can uh, diminish or it can explode. And this is exactly the reason why uh, there could exist some uh, data diffusion uh, in the infinite dimensional uh, space. Uh, if we apply online SGD, uh, we may still achieve diminishing access response. 
Okay. And the second uh, uh, block in this effect of burns uh, is uh, contributed by the stochastic gradient noise. Okay. So if we're doing gradient descent, then the, this, term, this term will uh, uh, disappear. But uh, since we are doing stochastic gradient descent, there are uh, ferns introduced by the stochastic gradient. So we will have this term. And this term uh, can be compared with uh, the, the first uh, rock, okay? Because uh, inside of the parentheses, uh, all those uh, terms are the same. But the coefficients are different. So instead of proportional to sigma square, here actually is proportional to uh, the norm of W star. Okay, the norm of W star. In fact, we can write it as uh, the uh, the h the height space norm of W star plus the h uh, tail space uh, norm of uh, W star. Okay. And uh, another thing I want to uh, mention here is. Uh, for all those arrow terms in effective bias and effective variance, uh, for all those arrow terms in the blue uh, color, okay? Actually, they correspond to the uh, arrow. They correspond to the arrow in the height space. And for all those uh, terms in the uh, green box, actually they correspond to the arrows in the, the tail space, okay? And this is uh, pretty nice because if, uh, this problem uh, reduced to a classical uh, setting where uh, the dimension of x is fixed uh, equal to d. In that case, you can just uh, choose k star equal to d. And then all those terms in this uh, uh, green uh, box uh, will be gone. Uh, there's no tail arrow. There's no uh, uh, arrows in the tail space for uh, finite d setting. And uh, in that case, we will we'll only have the arrows in the uh, the blue uh, box, so this turn, this turn, and this turn. Okay, so this is uh, the uh, one of the main results uh, we proved in our paper, and this uh, result is uh, actually pretty, uh, pretty tight, pretty sharp. The reason is uh, in the same setting, uh, we can prove a matching law bound, exact matching law bound. Okay, so basically, uh, in the same setting, we can show that for this uh, uh, constant step size. Uh, on SGD, the excess risk bound can be lower bounded by the sum of effective bias and effective bias. Okay, and if you compare this the effective bias and effective bias, uh, these two uh, lower bound uh, with previous upper bound, actually uh, they are exactly the same. So they are the same up to some uh, constant. So in other words, uh, we have shown that the excess risk bound we derived in previous slides actually uh, is uh, is is tight. And then a natural question is, uh, since the access risk bound is tight, uh, can we say something uh, based on the access risk bound, right? And as I mentioned before, uh, depending on how this term uh, in the effective burns uh, bound uh, behaves, the access risk of the online SGD can uh, diminish or can expose. So here I will give you uh, two examples of uh, uh, data diffusion on the which uh, if you do online 3D, uh, it will generalize, okay? So let's consider uh, the eigen, uh, example where the eigenvalue of H, uh, so each eigenvalue lambda K uh, is in the form of K2 minus alpha times uh, log K uh, to the power of minus beta, okay? And uh, by some calculation, we can show that if alpha equal to one and the beta is greater than one. So which means if the eigenvalue of decay is a slightly faster than uh, one, over k, one over k because of this log term. So it's a slightly faster than one over k. Or if alpha is greater than one. So in other words, if eigenvalue decay is faster than uh, one over k. In both uh, cases, uh, the access risk bound will diminish even if the D is uh, uh, infinite. And this actually uh, uh, suggests that uh, uh, even in the infinite dimensional uh, setting, if you do online SGD, uh, the solution in front of that online SGD can still generalize. Okay, to, uh, so to uh, another interesting aspect of this result is we can compare it with rigid regression. Uh, 
So in the top, this is the access response we derive for uh, online HD uh, with averaging. And in the bottom, uh, this is the uh, access response of rich regression uh, derived by uh, Chinga and uh, Bartlett. Okay. So they have uh, this very nice uh, access response uh, also derived in the uh, over parameterized setting. And uh, we can compare these two bonds uh, with each other. Uh, in particular, if you look at those terms in the blue box, uh, in our bond, and uh, those terms in the green box uh, in their bond. If we choose lambda, which is the regressing primate of rigid regression, this lambda uh, to be a uh, trace of uh, H. So this is a trace of H. Okay. In other words, this is the sum of all the eigenvalues uh, of the uh, data coherence matrix. If we choose lambda in this order, then actually these two bonds will be uh, in the same order. Because uh, this is a, a trace of H score, right? trace of H score, right? And then this term, uh, because the sum of uh, the tail eigenvalue and the lambda, if lambda is in the order of a trace of H, then this sum will be in the order of a trace of H and then take square. So they will be in the same order. So this is suggest that uh, online CDD uh, with uh, averaging uh, has the same generating uh, bound as rigid regression uh, with this particular uh, choice of uh, regressing parameter lambda. So a natural question is uh, if HGD can be better, can have a better generating performance than rigid regression, and if it can have better generation performance, uh, under what condition or what, under what settings uh, HGD can uh, get better uh, generation performance? So this is the question that uh, I will answer uh, in the second part of this talk. But for now, uh, let me uh, show you some additional result about online CD. Okay, so there's another uh, variant of online CD, which is called the tail uh, averaging uh, HGD. So instead of averaging the iterate from the beginning all the way to the end. So in tail averaging online GD, we only average the iterate uh, from the middle way, so from the middle to the end. The reason is when you run HD algorithm, at the beginning, the bias actually is very uh, large. If you do averaging, then you will accumulate a lot of bias errors in the beginning, so which is not uh, wise. Uh, uh, thing to do. So instead of doing averaging from the beginning, we will only average the iterate uh, from the middle uh, to the end. And because of this, you can see that we can improve the effective bias by having this actual exponential decay term, which is a identity matrix minus gamma times h to the power of n divided by two. Okay, so we will have these two uh, matrices. Uh, which is uh, exponentially decaying uh, with respect to the uh, number of iterations. And the variance bound actually will remain the same. Okay, it will only increase by uh, some uh, small constant, but the bias error will uh, have this exponential decaying factor inside. Okay, and this will improve the bias of a bound if we do tail averaging compared with averaging from the beginning. And of course, if you choose n, equal to zero. So in, uh, in, so in other words, uh, if we, in this summation, if we choose n uh, is equal to zero, then you can see that uh, this term will be gone. Okay, this term will be gone. And then the access, uh, the bias bound in the access risk uh, will uh, degenerate to the uh, bias uh, error bound in the, uh, in the previous uh, results. All right, so here's some uh, proof overview. And uh, so I will not go into the details, but the high level idea of this proof is, uh, uh, remember that the access risk can be written as W minus W star transpose H times W minus W star. And this can be written as the inner product of H and uh, the outer product of W minus W star, outer product with W minus W star. Okay. So in most of the uh, 
in existing uh, papers, when they prove the access risk bound for uh, HDD, they deal with uh, the, the L2 norm of W minus W star, which is not nice because if you deal with this norm, then in every iteration, there's some error. So in the end, there's a lot of errors and uh, you can use some kind of matrix vector uh, inequality, norm inequality to upbound this. Uh, uh, for example, you can upbound it by uh, H, uh, let's say special norm times W minus W star L2 norm square. Okay, so this will give you some uh, loose upbound. So in this proof, actually following uh, the technique uh, used in the GNR in that uh, paper, we may directly uh, deal with this W minus W star outer product matrix. Okay, so which is defined as sigma T. Sigma T is uh, the outer product of W T minus W star uh, and itself. So in this case, we don't lose any information. We only uh, calculate the upper bound in the end, but during the uh, uh, recursion, during the induction, uh, we directly uh, deal with uh, this matrix. So which maintains all the information uh, in the iterate double T. So this is the key ID. Okay. And we decompose this uh, uh, sigma T, which is the arrow uh, caused by the covariance of this arrow uh, vector. We decompose it into two terms, BT and CT. Okay. And uh, uh, interestingly, uh, both BT and CT, they have some uh, very nice uh, recursive uh, formula. Uh, so in other words, we can calculate the BT and the CT uh, by uh, recursion uh, from B0 and uh, C0, okay? And uh, for the uh, variance arrow, uh, which correspond to, which is related to CT uh, sequence, we can show that this CT sequence is uh, monotonically increasing uh, in this matrix inequality uh, sense. And we can first derive a crude upper bound uh, in this way, uh, which is in this form. So this is a crude upper bound. And given this crude upper bound, we can first refine uh, the CT upper bound by uh, using some uh, nice uh, matrix inequality and some uh, careful uh, calculation. And uh, as you can see in all this bound, the population data covariance matrix H are uh, retained. So this is uh, the reason why we can get this uh, data dependent uh, access risk bound and also uh, uh, so in other words, this is more like an instance-wise uh, uh, access response. And uh, for the uh, uh, upper bound of the bias arrow, uh, we uh, need to deal with BT. However, uh, different from CT, BT itself is not monotonic increasing in the major inequality size. So we need to uh, define another auxiliary sequence, which is the uh, sum of uh, BK uh, from zero to T. And this ST have some uh, similar properties of CT. And uh, we can also uh, get a crew bound of ST uh, by bonding it using, uh, for example, SN. And then uh, following similar proof, we can get a very tight upper bound of this uh, uh, ST sequence. Okay, so this is the uh, high level idea of the proof. And here are some uh, simulating uh, results. Uh, so we uh, tested different data covariance matrix uh, with different eigenvalue decay. And uh, as uh, you remember in this regime and in this regime, uh, for both of them actually online SGD can have diminishing access risk. And this is reflected in the uh, in the plot. So this uh, orange line is the test arrow of online SGD. So as the sample size increase, actually the test arrow will decrease. So this is consistent with uh, our previous uh, calculation. So this alpha equal to minus uh, alpha equal to one beta equal to two, so this is the alpha equal to two, okay, in previous example. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, uh, in the middle, actually the training arrow is always less than the base risk. So this is the, in the final overfitting regime where the online SGD can somehow memorize the uh, online streaming uh, chain data, but uh, the test arrow can still uh, diminish. So this is the final overfitting regime. And, uh, for the right subfigure, uh, the base, the training arrow and also the test arrow will convert it to the base uh, risk. So this is a, still a generalizable regime, but it's not a, in the final overfit regime because online GD will not memorize the online training data. All right, so we got a question. 
Yeah, so there's a comment that it'd be interesting to visualize the uh, distribution of eigenvalue spectrum. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So uh, probably uh, I can, yeah, we, we should add a plot of this uh, eigenvalue decay and also this one. Yeah, it's very easy to draw. So it's a, uh, like a, this one actually is a, both of them uh, uh, decaying uh, polynomially, but this one is like a decaying slightly faster than uh, one of i due to this logarithmic factor. And here are some additional uh, experimental comparison uh, between ordinary uh, this square root regression and the SGD. So the key takeaway from this uh, uh, six uh, plots is uh, in terms of the excess risk, uh, rigid regression and the SGD with tail averaging, uh, they are very close uh, to each other. And this raises a natural question is, uh, uh, by comparing the regression and the uh, online SVD with tail averaging, which one is better? Okay, because they perform very similar to each other. So uh, from previous uh, comparison between regression and the HGD, by choosing the regularizing parameter of regression lambda to be in the order of the trees of the uh, data covariance matrix, we show that uh, they are actually respond are very uh, close uh, to each other uh, equivalent, but uh, are in the same order. But uh, uh, if we, tune, for example, the regressing parameter of rigid regression, and also tune the learning rate of HGD, then uh, which one is better? So this is the uh, question I'm going to uh, answer in the rest of this talk. Okay, just to uh, uh, remind you uh, what is uh, uh, rigid regression, since I uh, haven't uh, uh, laid out the, the formula of uh, the, the optimizing problem of rigid regression. So this is the uh, rigid regression problem. Uh, these empirical risk minimization problems, we minimize the training loss, uh, regularized by this lambda times the L2 norm square of W. So lambda is a, a regularizing parameter. So usually we choose lambda greater than zero, but actually uh, in the overparameter setting, we, we can also uh, choose this lambda uh, to be a negative value, okay, which is a valid choice. And when the dimension D is less than the sum of size N, uh, digital regression have this cross form solution. And when the dimension D is greater than the uh, sum of size N, uh, uh, regression will have uh, this form, okay. So this is the rigid regression uh, uh, people are using uh, in practice. And for online HGD, uh, in this uh, comparison, we consider tail averaging online HGD because uh, both in stereo and in, in experiments, we, we've seen uh, better performance of online HGD with tail averaging. When you do tail averaging, you can further reduce the bias uh, error uh, by in introducing some exponentially decaying uh, factor in the bias error. Um, so, uh, just a quick question. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Even in the fixed, um, um, I guess, parameter setting. So if you go mm -hmm. to the slide, um, mm -hmm. if we... Uh, this, uh, this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one. So if we, uh, given your results, that mm -hmm. there is effective dimensionality k star um, based on the uh, eigenvalue uh, eigen spectrum. Um, mm -hmm. We then project, you know, look at just that subspace mm -hmm. uh, entailed by those first k star mm -hmm. uh, eigenvectors. And then mm -hmm. um, I just learned parameters in that subspace. Would that mm -hmm. give you much better results than any of these? So in other well, words, we do a dimensionality reduction by looking at just that subspace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you, for example, if you know uh, what is a uh, subspace, then definitely you can restrict uh, yourself to that subspace. Because uh, if we do online SGD, there are some uh, spillover error because uh, there's a head space and tail space. The error in the tail space will show up in the uh, access response. But if you know exactly what is the case stop, then you can uh, do, uh, for example, uh, this square or right? Uh, uh, just do uh, a regular uh, this square or ordinary this square in that subspace. Then you can get a smaller uh, arrow without the tail arrow. So this is like some oracle uh, but, estimator. But isn't K star just dependent on the eigenspectrum of your? Oh uh, no, K actually K star not only depend on. Okay, yeah. So here's a K star. So uh, Okay. Yeah, so K star actually will depend on the number of iterations N and also step size gamma. Hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So, so in other words, uh, whenever you pick a, a step size or learning rate gamma and uh, uh, number of iteration n, then mm -hmm. this k star will change. So in other words, uh, this k star divided by n actually uh, it will change over n. So that's the uh, change. Right. So uh, in the sense that, so let's just say I have a budget for n steps, n SGD steps. Mm -hmm. So sure. then n is known, and let's say we are in this fixed gamma setting, fixed learning mm -hmm. rate setting. So yeah, then I yeah. know both n and gamma, and I know the covariance matrix as well. Yeah, but, but this covariance matrix is a population covariance matrix. So ah. this lambda k is the eigenvalue of a population covariance. It's ah. not actually. I see, yeah, I yeah. see. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 thank you for the question. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let me uh, go to this slide. Yeah. All right, so uh, in this setting, so in order to compare the access risk of APD and the rigid regression, uh, we consider uh, two uh, data diffusions. One is called a one hot data diffusion. So in other words, the, un the feature actor is uh, randomly sampled from some uh, natural basis uh, EI. And another, uh, and uh, each e uh, EI is sampled with probability lambda i. And we uh, uh, restrict the, the sum of lambda i uh, equal to one and each lambda i is uh, uh, non-negative. So this lambda i can be uh, viewed as the, the the, uh, the distribution over some uh, discrete uh, uh, basis. And uh, we also consider Gaussian data. And for simplicity, we just consider standard uh, multi Gaussian okay, with zero mean and the covariance matrix H. Okay. And for, for the one hot uh, case, actually we have this result. So we first have this worst case result. So it is uh, stated uh, in a way that suppose n HGD and n ridge are the sample size of HGD and the ridge regression. And for any described problem, and for any ridge regularization parameter lambda, as long as the sample size of HGD is greater than or equal to the sample size of ridge regression, then there exists a choice of a learning rate of, uh, gamma star such that the access risk of HGD is always less than or equal to the access risk of ridge regression up to some constant. So remember that this is a worst case result because it holds for any d square uh, problems. And since it holds for any ridge regression uh, parameter lambda, so in other words, we can tune uh, this regularizing parameters to get the optimal regularizing parameter for any particular d square problem. And uh, even for the optimally regularized ridge regression estimator, as long as the sample size of AGD is greater or equal to the sample size of ridge regression, we can always find a proper learning rate for HGD such that the access risk of HGD can beat the access risk of ridge regression. Okay. So uh, this uh, suggests that uh, HGD is always competitive uh, with ridge regression. Okay, and then the next question is, what if the problem instance is not in the worst case? Let's consider some uh, good case. And we can show that there exists a family of the square problems of, uh, for this one hot data, uh, which I defined uh, in previous slide. And for any rigid regression parameter lambda, as long as uh, the sample size of HGD square is greater than or equal to the sample size of rigid regression, then there exists a choice of a, a learning rate gamma star for on HGD, such that the access of uh, access risk of HGD is less than or equal to the access risk of ridge regression up to some constant. So you can see that uh, uh, we only need the square of the uh, sample size for HGD to be greater than or equal to the sample size of ridge in order to make the access risk of uh, HGD to be smaller than the access of risk of uh, ridge regression up to some constant. So in other words, uh, this theorem suggests that even with optimally tuned regressing prime, because this result holds for any uh, ridge uh, regressing parameter lambda, which include the optimal uh, regressing parameter lambda. So even with optimally tuned regularization, ridge regression cannot compete with AGD 
unless uh, it will has quadratically more sample. So this is reflected in this uh, condition. So unless n ridge is greater than n h d square, so sample size of ridge regression is a square of the sample size of h g d. Otherwise, uh, there's no hope for uh, ridge regression to be uh, compatible with online uh, h g d. So both the worst case uh, result and this good case result suggest that uh, uh, online CD is almost uh, no worse than ridge regression. And probably in practice, uh, if you can do online CD, you definitely should do online CD uh, rather than uh, doing uh, ridge regression. Okay, so uh, how many uh, minutes do I uh, still have? Uh, yeah, you can, if you can finish in like five minutes, it'll be great. Okay, cool, cool, yeah. All right, so uh, so the previous result is for one hot data. And for Gaussian data, actually we have a, a, a similar result, but because of the diffusion is more com uh, more complex. So therefore, when we state this uh, worst case result and the good case result, we need to introduce some quantity uh, which is related to uh, this signal uh, noise ratio R squared, okay, which is defined as the ratio of W uh, H norm squared uh, defined by the variance of the uh, noise. And we also need to introduce some kind of a, a notion of a condition number, this cup of N, uh, which is uh, defined in this form. Okay. So in the worst case uh, for Gaussian data, uh, as long as the sum of size of HGD is greater than or equal to uh, some like uh, uh, some quantity times the ridge regression, and this log A actually is a logarithmic factor, then we can show that uh, the excess risk of bound of HD is no uh, worse than excess risk of uh, ridge regression. So this is the worst case result. And for the good case, actually, we can show that uh, for any problem uh, satisfying a certain uh, regularity condition, certain conditions on the uh, W star and also the underlying uh, data population uh, data population coherence matrix. Uh, we can show that as long as uh, the sample size of HGD is greater than the sample size of ridge regression, then uh, excess risk of HGD is better, is no worse than the excess risk of uh, ridge regression. Okay. And for some problem uh, instance, uh, even nicer uh, problems, uh, as long as uh, the square of the online uh, HGD uh, sample size greater than the sample size of the ridge regression, then uh, the excess risk of HGD uh, is uh, less than or equal to the excess risk of ridge regression up to uh, some constant. Okay. So I'm not going to uh, 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 pass this uh, result in, uh, in, in more detail because uh, uh, due to the uh, more complicated uh, citing of this Gaussian data, uh, so actually the conditions are a little bit uh, uh, complete, uh, more complicated than the uh, one hot data case. Okay. But I will give you some idea of this proof because I think it will be uh, helpful uh, to understand this uh, result. So basically we need to compare the upper bound of HGD with the lower bound of ridge regression because we want to show that the HGD is better or is in the worse than ridge regression. So naturally we need to compare HGD upper bound, uh, upper bound of the excess risk of HGD and the lower bound of the excess risk of ridge regression. And the due to uh, rotation invariant, actually we can decompose the risk, the excess risk bound uh, in a coordinate wise way. So we can write down the risk for each coordinate K, uh, which also corresponds to the corresponding uh, eigen uh, vector or eigen space of the uh, population coherence matrix. And once we uh, write down this up and the lower bound, we can identify uh, those quantities uh, that differs uh, between the upper bound of HGD and the lower bound of ridge regression. And then we can uh, try different uh, uh, choice of the learning rate as well as the regression parameter. So in other words, we can decompose uh, this comparison into two cases. If the regression parameter lambda is greater than or equal to the trace of the uh, population covariance matrix, in this case, we just uh, choose the learning rate uh, properly, then we can show that uh, the risk of HGD is always less than or equal to the risk of ridge regression. But if the regressing parameter of uh, if the regressing parameter of ridge regression is less than the trace of H, okay, and in this case, uh, we need to uh, 
uh, do more careful comparison. So we decompose the eigenspace into uh, three parts, uh, the, the height space, the tail space, and uh, the space in the middle, okay? And uh, we can show that in both the height space and in the tail space, the risk of HGD is always better than the risk of uh, uh, rigid regression by proper choice of the learning rate for any regression parameter lambda. Uh, we can show that. But in the middle, uh, it's not necessarily true. And therefore, we need to uh, figure out the class of proper instance such that the risk of HGD is less than the risk of rigid regression uh, for this uh, middle uh, eigenspace. And one possible way is to just uh, uh, choose the sum of size of HGD properly such that this middle space will be gone. So there's no middle space. So there are only high space and tail space to nice uh, subspace. And another possibility is we can define the eigenvalues in this uh, uh, middle eigenspace properly such that uh, uh, the risk of HGD will be less than the risk of uh, rigid regression. All right. So uh, finally, let me show some experiments. So we just uh, uh, compare rigid regression and the HGD uh, in order to achieve the same risk. We calculate the corresponding sample size and we plot uh, the sample size comparison between HGD and the rigid regression. So x axis is the sample size of HGD, uh, y axis is the sample size of uh, rigid regression in order to achieve the same uh, level of uh, access risk. And you can see that uh, uh, for different uh, eigenvalue decay and also for different choice of uh, uh, the weight uh, vector W star, uh, when the weight of uh, the coordinate of W star decays very fast, then uh, in order to achieve uh, the same access risk, HGD requires a much uh, smaller uh, sample size. Okay, so this uh, verifies our theoretical find, uh, findings in previous results. All right, so in the intro of time, uh, I will uh, wrap up here. So here's a summary. So we first uh, uh, derive the sharpest possible access risk bound for online HGD, uh, which uh, might the uh, certain lower bound. And we also provide an instance-wise comparison between HGD and the rigid regression to interpret the implicit regularization of HGD. And we show that for any problem instance, HGD with tuned step size can compete with optimally regularized rigid regression uh, if using uh, polylog recently more samples. And on the other hand, there exists a large class of problems. Uh, uh, HGD actually can compete with rigid regression with uh, quadratically smaller uh, sample size. And uh, these two actually together suggest that uh, uh, the implicit regularization uh, avoided by HGD actually, there's some advantage uh, against the, the explicit regularization in rigid regression. So probably this explains why uh, HGD uh, is so uh, useful and successful. Uh, at least for learning uh, this, this square uh, problem. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chen Chen. Uh, yeah, let's try to give a virtual round of applause, but uh, is there any questions or comments? Okay, so there's uh, there are actually two questions. Uh, maybe let's go, go yeah. over them. Uh, one by one. The first one is, sure. do you have an intuition of what the risk versus sample size relation would be when we consider more complex cases like in multi-layer perceptron? Yeah, that's a great question. And we do have some uh, ideas about that. So one way to extend this uh, result for linear regression to uh, new network is we can uh, use some uh, random feature model because for multi-layer perception uh, based on, let's say, uh, new tangent kernel or some kind of uh, uh, new network kernel, we can define the corresponding uh, random feature uh, models. And we can uh, easily carry, ov uh, carry over the result we uh, show here uh, for uh, the new network induced uh, random feature model. Another possibility is uh, instead of using uh, those new network kernels, uh, we can uh, define some uh, specific distribution, data distribution. And then uh, there exists some more uh, powerful technique than this uh, uh, analysis that we can uh, carry over some of these results to multi-layer perception. But uh, the response we obtain is not uh, 
not necessarily sharp. We don't have a lower bound result, but we can still uh, have very nice phase translation result uh, showing in the uh, excess risk of, uh, let's say, HGD for learning multilayer perception. Yeah. So we do have some uh, ideas, but the, uh, overall it's still an open problem. Thanks. Uh, yeah, the second question is on page 19 of the slides. Uh, in the leftmost mm -hmm. plot, the test loss seem, does not seem to be significantly decreasing. Uh, does one of the theorems explain this? Yes. So remember that uh, uh, in, in previous slide, in this slide, let me see. here, OK. We show that in order to make the access risk generalizable, okay, we uh, we need alpha equal to one and the beta greater than one. So alpha and beta are the degree of this uh, polynomial, or we need uh, alpha greater than one. So in the experiments, we consider the three case, right? So this is alpha equal to one, beta equal to two, okay, which is greater than one. This is alpha equal to two greater than one. So both of these two cases are the generalizable example. And this one, alpha equal to one, uh, which turns out to be a non-generalizable example. So this is actually a negative, uh, negative result, which is consistent with our uh, theoretical analysis. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Hopes that <laughs> kind of uh, helps that answer the question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other uh, questions, comments, or feedbacks for Chen Chen? Oh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, the video recording of this talk will be uh, online very soon, hopefully. Um, and just as a reminder, we're also meeting again next week. So thank you everyone. And thank you especially to Chen Chen uh, for taking the time and joining us and sharing us this, uh, with us all this uh, exciting progress um, on SGD related research and for participating in the seminar today, of course. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And a very nice meeting, uh, you guys. Yeah, hope to uh, see you guys in the future. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Hope to uh, host you.